two, two, two. Hey, you can hear me. Fabulous. Um, I hope you're all refreshed. We have James and James here to take us all on a pen testing adventure. Uh, we have one James who is from VGW and the other from Bankwest. So I'm sure it's going to be quite an interesting uh, session. If we have time, we'll have some questions at the end. So feel free to formulate those through the session. Without further ado, James and James. Everyone, uh, I'm James number one for the purposes of this talk. Uh, so I work at Bankwest in the identity platform. Um, in 2019, my friend convinced me to join his team uh, participating in WACTF. Uh, it's a cybersecurity competition, if you're not aware of it. Um, unfortunately, our team kind of arrived a bit late to the venue, and instead of being allowed in the room with the other guests, we got relegated to the foyer out there. <laughs> Uh, in spite of that, we took fourth place that year, um, and I kind of credit that with, uh, I guess, igniting a passion for cybersecurity. Um, so that's me. I'll let James two introduce himself now. Yes, and I'm James number two. James number one, just slightly cooler. I my interest in cybersecurity began when I was working at Bankwest in the grad program. I spent six months working there in the security operations center. And the team there was super passionate about security, and that ended up rubbing off on me a little bit. From there, I started participating in things like Hack the Box, WACTF, much the same as James. Um, James and I met together when we were uh, working for six months uh, at Bank West under Piers, who's in the room. <laughs> uh, we've kept in touch ever since, and uh, James suggested the idea of uh, doing a DDD talk together. I pitched the idea of doing a choose your own pen test adventure because it's something that I'm interested in and that's the idea we ended up sticking with. Uh, we also like to do gymnastics together on the weekly. <laughs> uh, so the goals of the session. We've got four main goals that we'd like the audience to take away from this. Uh, as long as you tick off at least one of those, I'll be satisfied. Uh, we'd like to give everyone here a little bit of a peek at what breaking into a website or a service looks like. Certainly when I was working as a software engineer, I very rarely got to see what that looks like. I knew that managing vulnerabilities was important and avoiding flaws that let people break in was important, but I never actually got to see it practically applied. We'd also like to share with you all some practical tips for the engineers in the room. Hopefully, whatever service or application you're working on at the moment won't be uh, vulnerable in the same way that our demo website will be. We'd also like audience participation. We've formed this as a choose your own adventure. We want the audience to feel empowered to actually make some of the decisions that are going to drive this live demo. Um, so we're hoping to give you enough context uh, that you feel comfortable making a bit of a decision and participating, which will hopefully lead to number four, which is giving you some inspiration. If anyone in the room is interested, definitely hit me up afterwards, but we'll also be sharing some resources at the end for anyone who thinks this looks cool and wants to do more of it to go and do it on the, in their own time after this session. So really hoping that some of you take that away from this. So how's the adventure, choose your own adventure, actually going to work? We're going to start off by doing a bit of, giving you a bit of context. We'll um, browse around the website at whatever point we're at, point out some interesting things that we've spotted, and then we'll go into explaining some of the options that, uh, that are available to us. From there, you'll see a screen that looks much like this one, so have your phones ready. There's a QR code. If you're at the back, it might struggle to scan, but we'll also read you out the six-digit number. Uh, so you can use one or the other. You either go to strawpoll.live and enter the six-digit code, or you scan the QR code on your phone. Both will take you to a actual um, straw poll where you can cast your votes. This one's not the real one, so this is just a demo one. I see people taking the QR code won't work. <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to hop on the keyboard now, and James is going to narrate, narrate while I start exploring the website. All right, so the uh, app that we're going to be pen testing is a, an online pen store. Um, unfortunately, because of some VPN issues, the uh, thumbnails are not loading, but um, these are various different pens that you can browse through and add to your cart. There's also a search feature up here. You can type in a query and it'll filter the list um, to ones that match that query. 
There's a gallery here, once again, VPN issues, so the content is not loading. Um, but imagine there's some beautiful pen pictures here. Um, finally, we see a, a login page. Um, so we know that there's some kind of account system on this website. We're going to register an account for the purposes of this test. So there's obviously no password policy because we're not getting any validation errors. So we've just put in test as a password. We connected. All right. I might swap across to the video. It looks like we're going to have to fall up. back on a, on a pre-recorded video because our, our VPN is uh, acting up. So we've, we've registered our user. We're logging in now. Yep, so obviously a different user, um, given that it's pre-recorded. So once you're in, there's a profile page here. Um, and in that page, you can update some of your profile details, so your name and email address. And uh, looking at the URL, we can see that this is hosted in S3. So that tells us that it's a static website. Um, so we're going to kind of browse through the, the JavaScript code that um, we can see in the dev tools and see if we can um, find anything interesting. So we're going to start noticing that it's React. Um, and we're just going to try to enumerate the routes that are available to see if there's any pages that we haven't been able to find yet. Um, so we'll do that by prettifying the code. And then we're going to search for a route that we know exists, in this case, slash login. Um, and we've immediately found a list of all of the routes. So one that we um, haven't seen yet that's interesting is this add product page. Um, so we're just going to go and navigate into that and see if um, there's anything interesting there. All right, so we get a forbidden error. So immediately that tells us we've got some kind of role based access control in place. Um, so, next order of business, we're going to try to enumerate the roles that exist. Um, so we're just going to search for strings that tend to appear in role names, guest, user, admin. Um, and it looks like we found a map of roles. And it looks like admin and user are the only two roles that are defined. Since we didn't have access to add product page, we can deduce that we're probably just a normal user. Um, but we're going to confirm that by looking in local storage, which is where single page apps tend to put their session data. And uh, we can see here that there's a role field, and we are indeed a user. Right, so having seen that, that gives us our first goal, which is going to be to become the website admin. So let's look at the options that are available to do that. So the first option, classic SQL injection, uh, show of hands if you've heard of it. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much everyone. Um, so in our case, we have this search feature, which is probably a good candidate. Um, so if our products are stored in a SQL database, which is being queried to uh, produce the search results, um, we can assume that our query might end up embedded in a query like this, where it's filtering on rows that have a description field containing our search term. Uh, now, if the website is vulnerable to uh, SQL injection, um, we would imagine that we could put in um, a query that can escape this context and, and do something more malicious with it. Um, but there'll be more detail on that if we choose that option. Second option um, is mass assignment. Um, so this one relies on the fact that we know that there's some kind of admin user. We know that we can register a basic user. And the question is, can we upgrade our existing user or register a new one as an admin? So um, we can assume that there's some kind of role column stored in the user data. If there's an API endpoint that doesn't enforce proper validation, uh, it may allow us to overwrite some fields that we're not supposed to by forcibly providing extra input and thereby force our user to become an admin. Again, more detail on that if we choose it. Finally, brute forcing. Pretty simple. If we spam login attempts, we might be able to uh, ascertain the, user, the admin's username and password. We don't know their username, but we can take some guesses at it. Um, again, we'll look at that in more detail if that's what gets chosen. All right, so you've seen all the options. Now it's time to vote. Uh, if you're at the back and you're having trouble reading that, the URL is strawpoll.live, and the pin number is 602156. So um, as soon as we get a clear result on the poll, we'll, uh, we'll call it and we'll go down that path. Yeah, we won't be waiting for absolutely everyone to vote, unfortunately. As soon as we have a clear winner, we'll go ahead just in the interest of time. Just trying to see if anyone's phones are still up. 
we'll go across, we'll look at the results. Oh. No internet. Uh oh. <laughs> Minor problem. That explains the, uh, that explains VPN, the issue. VPN issue. Uh, no wonder I needed to use the, the video backup. All right, looks like, yeah, it looks like mass assignment is a, is a pretty clear winner. So uh, let's go down that path. Um, All right, I'll, uh, well, hopefully while that's reconnecting, it requires a password, on my. All right. <laughs> I'm just going to go ahead with the video. <laughs> All right, so here we are. Um, the page that catches our eye as far as potential mass assignment vulnerability is the profile page, so we can update some of the user's details. Um, so we're just going to turn on this tool called Burp Suite, um, which is going to let us intercept requests and actually see what's happening behind the scenes when we do this. So, let's go to... right, so just for a, a simple explanation of how this works, normally your browser will send web requests directly to the backend API. Um, we're turning on a tool called Burp Suite, which kind of proxies that, um, takes requests, intercepts them, allows you to tamper with them or repeat them, uh, and forwards them onto the API. So that'll just give us some uh, means of kind of messing with these requests and seeing what we can do. Right, so ignore this first request because you can see it's just an options request, just required um, for cause to work. Um, this is the one that we're interested in. Uh, this is the one where you can see all of the data that we entered into the um, into the profile form has gone through, and we're just going to send it to repeater, um, which will let us kind of duplicate this request later. And we can see in what comes back here that we've got the complete uh, set of user claims, including their role. But note that all we sent in that request was just the details that we were allowed to update. So now we're going to try to tamper with this. Um, in particular, we're going to add a role field, and we're going to put admin in there, and we're just going to see if that succeeds and what happens. We got a 200 response, so uh, it succeeded in sending the request, and we can see that the role field says admin now, so that's a good indicator that we've probably succeeded. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is just log out and back in, because this website wasn't really designed most likely for a user to change their role mid-session, so just to avoid any inconsistencies and make sure we refresh the session state. All right, now that we're here, we can see immediately that we have a new menu that we didn't have before, and it includes this add product page, which we can now access. Right, so we are now in. <laughs> All right, so time to reflect a little bit on what the developer did right and wrong here. Um, so what, what's actually happened is that they've intended to uh, send these um, details that are allowed to be updated, email, first name, and last name, and uh, superimpose them on the existing user record and store that in the database. When we included an extra field role, um, there was nothing in the API that validated that, and there was nothing that stopped it from being superimposed on top of the user record and being stored. So it just accepted it, saved it, and we became an admin. All right, so what they should have done is allow listed user input explicitly. So you only allow the fields that should be updated by that endpoint, in this case, email, first name, and surname. Um, another thing they could have done is just to not use local accounts at all. It's very difficult to implement good um, user account management. There's a lot of issues um, that kind of come into play. Using a third-party service like um, Azure AD or Cognito or Auth0, something like that um, will solve a lot of those problems for you. Um, and also, just a note on this, um, a couple of popular JavaScript frameworks are vulnerable to this out of the box. So Nest.js and um, Fastify both will, by default, not validate input fields and will just kind of deserialize whatever you send it. And um, if you don't check for that explicitly, they will save it. All right, so now James is going to hop on the keyboard. I've tethered, so hopefully we've got internet. If I just refresh GitHub, yeah, okay, we've got internet. We can resume the live demo. Uh, I guess just log in as the admin user. 
So now James is going to explore what permissions we've got now that we're admin. And we'll, we'll, I showed briefly uh, what was there in the, um, oh, might have to restart the VPN, yeah. Do you remember my password? <laughs> <laughs> Give that a go. If not, we, we've still got the video backups. <laughs> you might have to refresh this to get the, the login working again. Have we overwritten the user credentials? Uh, no. All right, we're in as admin, as, as we were before. OK, we, so we've got this admin uh, menu that we've gained access to, and there's a number of different buttons on there. So we've got these server logs. It, the features clearly are work in progress with some, some sample logs in there, not quite finished. We've got some notes that we can access. These are developer notes with a bunch of to-do list items. So the developers mentioned that there's an ad product feature that shouldn't be using eval for parsing. Some of you might recognize that as a interesting thing. Uh, add drop down to the logs page to view different log files instead of query parameters. That's another interesting one for us. Stop using the API, as a, uh, API host as a jump box. Remove unnecessary privileges. Implement a couple of features. So there's a bunch of cleanup that the developers left themselves. Clearly a work in, product, uh, work in progress website. We've got the add product feature, which we mentioned earlier that we were interested in. Uh, so from this page, it seems like a, you can add a new product to the to the page, Ooh, to the website. If we're having trouble, it, it's still tethered. No, okay. It doesn't look like the internet is down. It just looks like uh, the VPN is In interfering with the with the page. Yeah. And we've got add image to gallery, which is still under construction. So that seems to be the extent. There's, no, there's nothing else obvious that the admin seems to have access to. So let's discuss some of the options that we see ahead of us. Uh, yes. <laughs> we're, we're an admin and we've gained, gained access to all of this, but we want to go deeper. We want to get onto the actual host machine. So how are we going to do that? We've got a couple of different options. Number one is information disclosure. This one's relatively self-explanatory. It means the website discloses information that it otherwise shouldn't. So in this case, we're looking at the server logs feature, and we're going to see if we can manipulate that into providing us with information that it otherwise shouldn't be. Normally, it should only give us access to logs. The developer mentioned that there's some work still to be done on this page, so we'll see if we can manipulate that to uncover more information, which will help us get onto the box. Next up is remote code execution. This one's a pretty severe one to have on your site. If it does come up, uh, everyone probably has heard of Log4Shell uh, late last year, early this year. Yeah, it caused quite a panic, lots of frantic patching. That was an example of remote code execution. There's a number of different ways that remote code execution can come up, but a very common theme is deserialization. In that case, an attacker can craft a specially crafted payload so maybe a profile, uh, profile picture with some code in it that's not really a JPEG. They provide that to the target, and when the target goes to read that data, you, the attacker will ha has crafted a payload that's exploiting the way that it reads that data to then uh, get it to do whatever it wants, <laughs> potentially die. <laughs> Uh, in this case, we'll be looking at the add product feature to see if we can manipulate it. Based on the developer notes, they mentioned they're using eval for parsing the, the input from the, from the user. Uh, so we'll have a look and see if we can manipulate that to run whatever code we'd like. Uh, so once again, we have come to a decision point. Vote on your phones for whichever option. So for those at the back, the code is 169648 if you need it. We'll give it a minute for people to have the URL loaded up. All right. Hopefully, the results should be off on the other side. If we're tethered, we should be able to actually see the results ourselves this time. All right. Looks like a pretty clear win for remote code execution. Thanks for all your votes. We'll proceed with that option live now. 
All right, so James is now going to do a, do a demo of this. Hopefully, we can do it live and not use the video recording. So James is now navigating to the Add Product feature. And he's turning on Burp again, which we saw in the previous, previous layer. And James is just going to enter some data into this form. It doesn't really matter. And he's going to submit. Oh, yeah. Turn the VPN back on and submit. And now we can see the request has been intercepted by Burp. Again, we've got this options request, which we're not interested in. We go ahead to the post request. And James is now sending that to Repeater for us to repeat the request. So now if James scrolls down in the request, we can see the actual payload that he submitted in the form. And what he's going to do now is he's going to update that payload to something else. We're going to try and see if we can get remote code execution. So he's just put in just a string there, see what we get back out of the API. We get a 500 internal server error. Unexpected identifier. OK, not particularly helpful to us. Uh, now James is going to do a random shot in the dark, See, have a look if, uh, oh, you're missing the one, yep. Uh, we're just going to see if 1 equals equals 1, if we get any sort of uh, parsing of that input and re returning as true. So we get a 200 OK from the API. And OK, maybe the error codes could use some work. It says parsed input could not be read correctly with the uh, additional information being true. Uh, that to us hints that we've got some sort of remote code execution, because the 1 equals equals 1 has, re has been evaluated as true instead of maybe just being interpreted as a string. Uh, so now what James is going to do is try and identify what we're working with here. If you, if you Google eval, uh, the top two results are JavaScript and Python. So James is just going to try a quick JavaScript uh, command here and see if we get a response back. So we get a 200 OK, and we now have what appears to be the current working directory of the running process. Uh, hopefully everyone can see that. But it says, it, basically, we see what looks like a uh, folder path there. So now that we've identified that we're working with JavaScript and we've got remote code execution, the rest is relatively simple. You can go by a, a, a playbook. So what James is doing now is installing a tool called Netcat. This is a tool that we'll be using to uh, set up a remote shell. We're using the yum package manager here, assuming that we're working with an EC2 instance, because the front end was S3. It's a relatively safe assumption that the back end is EC2, which allows us to use yum. Uh, in this case, we've, we're using a child process to run the command, so we're not actually getting any immediate um, response back. So at this stage, we're working a little bit blind. This is a very common theme for these sorts of things, is you will set something up and assume that that has worked when you go on to your next step. And you'll find out at the next step if it actually worked correctly. What James is now setting up is using Netcat, which we just installed, to set up a bind shell listening on port 8181. We'll explain more about these reverse shells and bind shells in a second. Again, we don't get any immediate response back um, because this is working through a child process. We're just going to have to assume that it's worked, and we're now going to try and connect to the target. Uh, yep, in a new tab, James is now going to run that. And we don't get any immediate response. But if James runs who am I, it seems we're root on the target. We're in the, in the folder that we saw earlier. And we've got access to the files there. Uh, so it looks like we're on the actual target. James is now just going to upgrade our shell to something a little bit nicer. There we go. So we're root on 10.0.0.10, and we're in the, in the folder that you can see there. So we're in. We're in as a, on the host machine now. We can skip straight to remote shells. Yep. So what we've set up currently is a bind shell. Uh, in the commands that James run, he ran, he set up uh, Netcat. And he configured it on the target to listen for an incoming connection on port 8181. And then the attacker, that's our, my laptop here, connects directly to that IP address on that port. And now we have a connection. 
The inverse of this is a reverse shell where you set up the attacker to listen. So I would set up a process on the laptop to listen and then get the actual target to reach back out to me. This is much more common in practice because you, it doesn't require nearly as much knowledge about the target. You don't need to know the IP address of your target for it to reach out to you. It just has to have internet connectivity. Uh, you don't need to have a port available on the target to bind to because you're, you're, you're only listening on your actual attacker. Either way, the end result is the same. We have a connection between the attacker and the target, and we, as the attacker, can tell the target to do whatever we want it to do. Now, onto eval. Let's reflect a little bit on what the developer was doing here. We don't have access to the code, but we can more or less guess that they, they knew this was wrong because they left themselves a note to remove the use of eval. Uh, but they also had this hidden behind the, the admin role. They were the admin of the website, probably, and only admins could access this feature, so why worry about locking it down? It's not customer-facing anyway. Um, however, yes, they did know it was wrong. If you Google eval JavaScript, the top five results are all various warnings about <laughs> not using eval, so don't do what this developer did. Yep, never use eval. You should in instead use a JSON parsing library to parse JSON. It, under the hood, probably a lot of them do end up using eval at some point, but they do all sorts of validation and make sure that you're not giving it anything nasty uh, before just running code. Um, so that's it for that layer of the demo. I'm now going to hop back on the keyboard, and James is going to narrate while I explore our newfound permissions. Yeah, right. So we're now on the host. It's an EC2 instance, so we're actually on AWS infrastructure. Um, so the natural next step for us is going to be to um, try to see what um, stuff we can get to in the AWS account. Um, so one natural target would be querying secrets manager for secrets that are available and seeing if we can read any. So this is an AWS CLI command that's going to do exactly that. Um, so we can see a list of secrets that have been returned. So that means we have the list secrets permission. Doesn't guarantee that we have permission to read it. <laughs> so there's a secret here that clearly catches our eye, super duper top secret. So let's see if we can read that. All right, so this is the CLI command that we need to use to actually query the contents of that secret. And we get an access denied exception. Um, so that is an AWS IAM error that tells us that we're not authorized to access that resource. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of uh, recon. We're going to try to figure out what permissions we do have and see if there's a way we can escalate our privileges. So uh, James is just querying the metadata endpoint that the EC2 instance has access to to find out the name of the role that it's using. And then attached to an IAM role in AWS can be one or more policies, which are documents that define permissions. So now we're going to look at the role policies that are attached to that role. And we can only see one. So now the next thing we're going to do is actually query the policy document um, that that role, um, that that policy contains. And we can see a whole bunch of permissions here. Um, when we scroll up, we can see that we do have the secrets manager get secret value permission um, assigned to us. But it's scoped to these resources that, um, that have these ARN prefixes. Um, and our super duper top secret is not among that list. Um, we do, however, have a big list of permissions here um, that we do have. EC2 run instances is one that catches our eye, as is create policy version. Um, and if you scroll down a little bit more, I am pass role. Um, and if we keep scrolling, we can see as well that um, the resource section of, of that um, is a wild card, so we can execute these permissions on any resource in the account. All right, so that gives us our third goal, which is to start exfiltrating secrets. Um, so we want to get this super duper top secret. First role to do that, or first option to do that, is to use the pass role permission. Um, so the purpose of this is that it allows one resource to pass a role to another. So say you're provisioning an EC2 instance, uh, you can give it a role, 
Um, and then if we were to leverage that, we could then connect into that EC2 instance via SSH. Um, and then as we're doing currently with the API host, we can just use the uh, role that it has available. Second option is create policy version. Uh, despite the name, this is just an update policy um, permission. So what it allows us to do is create a new version of a policy. So at the moment, if we query secrets manager, uh, we get an access denied error because we don't have the permission to access it. But what we can do, based on what we've found, is we can just update that policy to allow us to do it. And then next time we try to query it, we should be able to do that. All right, so time to vote. Um, once again, if you're at the back of the room, the code is 939765. Um, and again, we're just going to go until we have an authoritative result. Uh, not until every single vote it comes in. Got one or two phones still up. We'll wait till. All right. Have a look at the results. <coughs> oh, this one's pretty tight. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> it's a dead heat. All right, it, it kind of looks like create policy version is winning by a hair, but we'll... Is anyone still trying to vote? Is this it? Any tiebreakers coming in? All right. All right. I'll take There's the silences. <laughs> oh, well, there's one close up. <laughs> we'll give it five more seconds. Surely someone evens it up. <laughs> <laughs> Someone open up incognito on your on your browser and do a second vote. Uh, it looks like create policy versions one. <laughs> Only just. That's the closest we've seen it. All right. So create policy version has it. So uh, let's go do that and see if we can get that secret. All right. So what we're going to do now is create a new version of the policy that's attached to our role. So the first thing we're going to do is go back to that query that we used before to list the policies that are attached to the role. Um, so the name of the policy that we're after is simple policy. It's the only one there. And we've got the ARN of it there, which we're going to need to make a command to update it. All right. So this is one very big inline command that James is going to paste in that's going to do the update operation. But um, I will talk to it piece by piece. Right. So first line of the thing there, the first main argument is that ARN that we just looked up which is the uh, policy that we're going to be updating. Um, following that, you can see the actual policy document. We've just pasted it there as inline JSON. Um, the most important parts are this statement here that contains the um, action section that says secrets manager lists secrets and secrets manager gets secret value. So that's going to allow us to get the secret value. And importantly, we've got a wildcard for the resource section. So this policy will have um, permission to read any secret that's in the account. Um, finally, we can see set as default. That's just another flag we set, which makes that the, the default version that's going to be used by any role that isn't pinned to a specific version of the policy. Our shell's a little wonky, which is why you can see all the, uh, all the commands are repeated a second time. All right. So having run that, uh, it succeeded. We didn't get any errors. And we now have a new version of the policy there, version 3. And because it, we gave it set as default, it is now the default. Um, right, so now we're just going to go back to the CLI command that we ran before to get the secret value and uh, see if it works. So it did work. We didn't get the same error. And we have in secret string here the actual content of the secret. Um, now, in this case, this is just a flag. But obviously, in a real application, it could be something uh, far more interesting, like database credentials or really anything. Um, also worth calling out at this point that um, although we just used our powers to uh, give ourselves access to read any secret in the account, we do effectively have admin access. We could have written any policy that allowed any or all um, AWS API actions, um, and that would have been accepted, and we would have those permissions. All right. So how do we get here? Oh. Right, so um, let's just reflect a little bit on uh, what the developer did right and wrong. 
Um, oh, actually, first off, we're going to talk about automation because um, we just did that by hand uh, and we were lucky in that we had permissions in our role to list the policies that are attached to the role uh, and to query the granular permissions that um, that policy consists of. If you don't have that, there are tools available um, that can do it for you. Um, examples being Weird Al, Paku, and Red Bodo. And uh, what they'll basically do is uh, hit the AWS API using uh, your credentials, probe it, and they can distinguish from the error messages that they get whether you actually have that permission or not. Um, so if you're working blind, those tools really help you out. All right, now we're going to reflect on what the developer um, should have done. Uh, the main thing is they should have applied the principle of least privilege. Uh, this being an API host, it should have had one clear role and only had permissions it needed for that. So they should have segregated the duties. That EC2 instance shouldn't be spinning up other infrastructure, nor should it be manipulating IAM policies. Um, and another recommendation would be don't put wildcards in your IAM policies. Scope them as granular as you can to the actual resources that you do need to manipulate. And that brings us to the end of the live demo of the pen test. So what did we learn? We learned to sanitize and control user inputs wherever they arise, follow the principle of least privilege, like James just mentioned, apply defense in depth. This is particularly relevant, especially to that, that second and third layer, where the developer left themselves a bit of a mess, some notes. They said to themselves, well, this thing's a bit buggy. It's a bit vulnerable, but it's not customer facing anyway. I'm the admin. Who, what could go wrong? You should always be assuming that, well, you shouldn't always assume that your defenses will fail, but you should aim to minimize blast radius whenever someone can get into one layer to prevent them from being able to exploit that to get further access. Uh, ideally, if there weren't those bugs in that, for that second layer, the, uh, an attacker that got in through the, the first bug, which was the mass assignment, wouldn't be able to then get onto the actual API host through further exploitation. They would just be able to read the to-do list, and that would be about it. The rest of the learnings depend on the path we took. So I hope you were paying attention during the various reflections. Uh, different paths would, would have had different key takeaways. How can you get into this? Uh, like I promised, we're, we're hoping to expire at least some of the audience to participate in this sort of thing. Uh, try Hack Me and Hack the Box are both really valuable resources that I've personally really enjoyed. Uh, I spent about a year working with Eric, who's in the room, on various Hack the Box exercises. They were lots of fun, uh, really satisfying to break into. Particular shout out to IPSEC Tutorials. Uh, whenever a box gets retired, you can be sure that there's a really useful uh, and thorough video tutorial on how to break into that box. It will go up on YouTube immediately after. Pentester Lab and OWASP Juice Drop are other things that I haven't used personally, but have had recommendations for. There are also some certs you can aim for in this space, not really for the beginners, but uh, something to maybe aspire for. Uh, I'm also interested in going for these myself. OSCP and CEH, uh, Offensive Security Certified Professional and Certified Ethical Hacker. That was a mouthful. Uh, uh, interesting certs that uh, I think anyone in this space could be interested in aiming for eventually. And then like James and I mentioned, WACTFs or, WACTF or really any CTFs are a great environment to get exposed to all sorts of things related to pen testing or cyber in general. Uh, and they're a great environment, like full, uh, it's a very supportive community and just a, a great area to learn about these sorts of things other than being left out in the foyer <laughs> when you arrive late. <laughs> Finally, we'd like to give a Big thanks to all the sponsors of DDD, without which this talk would not have been possible. So thank you very much. And that's all from us. We've got about five minutes left in this session. If anyone has a question for James down the back. Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, let's say you're just a graduate postgrad or undergrad cybersecurity student. So to further increase, improve your chances and having no internship available or made to you, you just do some more CTFs and then try and get some more certifications and then f fingers crossed and the company will look at you even though you don't have any years of experience to employ you as a pen tester, etc. 
Um, to be clear, neither James nor I are professional pen testers. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of looking for jobs, most of, most of the pen testers I know are actually ones who went in from software engineering. That's not necessarily the only path. Uh, obviously, now more and more there's more focus on, on uh, cybersecurity studies. Um, and you could potentially get into that by entry level roles. Um, most of the pen testers I know are not so entry level though. I don't know. I feel like there's probably more analyst roles that would be a suitable start, would be my, my gut instinct, but I haven't done a huge amount of research into actually becoming a pen tester. So. Can I also add there's a thousand people here today, and so there's going to be a few people in the room. There's certainly some of the organisations are recruiting. So the more people you meet today, the better your chances are of finding that. Have we got another question from anyone? Cool. Uh, thanks for the talk today, guys. Um, so my question is, I, I appreciate that both of you guys are in software engineering, not um, cyber at the moment. But um, my question is, in an enterprise pen test, um, how do you know the scope of which to you know, basically attack the system you're trying to you're trying to test to, because obviously you could spend lots of time and eventually break in, but you probably have limited resources and limited time, so. Yeah, I mean, that's, that really ends up being an agreement between the, the pen tester and the, the testee. Um, so yeah, that, that varies. I know certainly when I was working at Bankwest, there's all sorts of um, meetings with the team beforehand where you talk about what the exact scope of the work will be and I'm sure the same can be applied to basically any pen test, right? You, you agree with the client what the scope of the pen test is, how long you're going to spend on it. Um, you've probably, as, as a pen test, you've probably got a playbook of like a very systematic approach to testing all sorts of vulnerabilities and you go through those and if you find stuff, you find stuff and you report those back. If you don't, you don't uh, and then yeah, the depth at which your your pen testing again would be something agreed on, probably prior to the test, unless maybe you're doing a pure red teaming exercise, in which case uh, potentially all bars are off, but uh, <laughs> unlikely. Awesome. Um, we've probably got time for one more question. If there's anyone else, no? can I ask a question then? Oh, there is a question. <laughs> More an observation, really, but um, I, I've been in software development for a while, and there's almost no code base that doesn't have any kind of vulnerability or, or something if you look look and dig deep enough. So there's always something to find, no matter where you're looking. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would 100% agree. Uh, that's kind of a, just a quick comment as well, as that's obviously another argument for applying defense in depth and just making sure that... Uh, if any layer of your architecture does get breached, that you kind of minimise the, the risk that that poses to other layers. And I'd assume that's where the um, bounty hunting and the rewards come from for a lot of these organisations I've seen. So you, if you're looking for a job in this space, then go for a bounty hunting expedition, another pen testing adventure. Can I have another round of applause for James 1 and James 2? Thank you. Thank you. So there's about 10 minutes until the next session. If you need to change rooms, please do get in there quickly. Our next session here is on web APIs and two-factor authentication. <laughs>